no cell phones, please. Um, okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the 10th R event and the first one of this new year. Uh, today we're going to talk about learning and education. My name is Andre, and I will be your host for the evening. Um, I'm a PhD student here at the Champalimau Foundation in neuroscience, and I want to start by explaining to you why I think education is interesting. But for me, in order to explain that, I need to give you a little bit of my background, what I did in the past. So ever since I was a kid, I was really, really driven into math. I really fell in love with math, and I really liked concepts, philosophical concepts like infinity and the zero and positive numbers and negative numbers. And one of the first things that I was interested in were these structures that some of you probably already know because you were here in the R event about emergence. And the ones that you don't know, I will explain what, it, what they are. They're called fractals. They're mathematical structures that consist of repetitions of the same pattern. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you come from afar or close, you always see the same thing emerging over and over again. So they're mathematical structures, and so you can create them artificially in a computer. But they also exist in a way in nature. So here you have some examples of fractals that occur in nature. So a snowflake, vegetables, the blood vessels in your retina, and the patterns that you see in leaves. The interesting thing for me in fractals is that you have a very simple set of rules that interact locally, and then suddenly you see this emerge on a global scale. So for me, this simplification of something that comes from a very local thing and then emerges into something bigger was the motivation behind the reason I went to study physics. So I went to the university and I decided to study physics. At the same time, I was leaving my parents' place and I was in need of money, so I started working. I looked for a job and I started working in a tutoring institute that was helping kids that had a lot of problems in school. I thought this was pretty easy for me because I knew a lot about physics and math, but I rapidly realized that I was completely mistaken. This was one of the most difficult things I'd done in my life. So for you to have an intuition of this, I will explain to you the story of Gonzalo. So Gonzalo was a very particular kid that I have that was having a lot of problems in school. He had failed for two years in a row in eighth grade, and he had a lot of difficulties in math and languages. So the first time I was with this kid in this session, I just gave him this set of exercises that I usually give just to know and understand how good they are at math. And so this kid looks at the exercises and he reads it once and then he looks back at me. He reads it again and he looks again back at me. And then he starts laughing hysterically. I ask him, don't you understand what's in the exercise? And he said, no. And I ask him, do you know how to read? And he said, yes, of course I know how to read. Um, I remember that this session was exactly like this the whole time. And it ended up being me doing the exercises for him, and he couldn't understand what I was talking about. I remember going back home and just thinking, this kid is really stupid. Um, as I told you, at the same time I was in, in the university and I was studying physics. And there was this particular subject that I had a lot of difficulties called statistical physics. And we have like one of these old school teachers that just writes a lot in the board and he's very aggressive. And he used to write equations in the board and ask the people in the audience if they know what the equations were. And one of these sessions he wrote a very, now I know it's a very famous equation, but he asked all the people in the class, do you know what this is? No one replied, there was an awkward silence. At the certain point, read with anger, the teacher just looks at the audience and says, are you all stupid? And that was the moment when he used the exact same word that I used to think about Gonzalo that made me realize, well, I don't think we are stupid. I may be wrong. But I have some sort of evidence that we're not stupid. First, we do have a brain. And if you think about it, the goal of education in the end, is that you want to teach something to someone, so you want to change the brain of that person. And you want to change the brain in a way that they are able to uh, uh, accept or incorporate new knowledge. 
So my thought was, how can I change the brain of this kid? In order to explore a little bit more about this neuroscience meets education, we have Dr. Paul Howard Jones to explore a little bit more about this bridge in neuros neuroscience and ed education. But l let me go back. So what, what, I, what I noticed was that I have a brain, but I couldn't understand what my teacher was saying. Gonzalo also had a brain, and he couldn't understand what I was saying. So there was a problem in language. I need language in order to change his brain. And we were just speaking in different languages. We weren't stupid, we just couldn't understand each other. So for you to have an intuition of this, I'm, I'm giving you this example. So kids in eighth grade are supposed to do this pretty easily. And this is a good example of, uh, it's a good example of an exercise that you're supposed to do back then because you only have to combine equation solving and then you have a second knowledge that you need to use, which is inequalities. The problem was that Gonzalo would look at this and he wouldn't understand what it meant, this, x bigger than y. Well, x and y are letters. What do you mean one letter bigger than the other? Letters are not quantities. So, okay. Started thinking, I need to know this kid. I need to know more about him. So the next couple of sessions, we talked about a bunch of things about his life and so on. And actually, we found out something in common, an interest in common. So we were, the two of us were obsessed about Benfica. And this kid was completely nuts. This kid was crazy. This kid all, knew everything about all the players, all the history, everything. So I decided to go back and look at this exercise and think, can I make it in a way that he understands? So I asked him, this was in 2008, I asked him, between Cardoso and Liedson, who was the best tracker last season? This kid knew the stats by heart, so he just said, well, it was Cardoso, he scored more goals. I told him, okay, now think, if they played a no different number of games, how can you control for that? So he looked at the number of games that each had played, he noticed that Cardoso had played more, and he thought a little bit about this, and. At a certain point, he came out with this number, which was the mean number of goals per game. I decided to take the things a little bit further, and I asked him, okay, but now if, I want you to take out the number of penalties that each scored. So he looked at the number of penalties, he realized that he had to subtract the total number of goals with this and do the division. In this case, actually, Liesen would end up being a better striker. Now, the thing that I want to point out is that I took this language from, that the kid was familiar with and he was motivated with, and I then used this to bridge it to these abstract concepts of X and Y. In the long run, after a few sessions, the, the kid was able to look at these exercises and solve them. So in the end, he was able to see that B was actually the correct response in this exercise. Okay. This made me decide to look at the math books and look at the exercises and try to figure out why this kid was having problems. And I rapidly realized that now with all the technological boom and Facebook and Twitter and so on and all the information that comes in, these kids look at these exercises. It's pretty straightforward to see. And they really think that they are boring. Okay. But for me, this was counterintuitive really counterintuitive. Ever since I was a kid, I really liked math. And then I decided to study physics, so I was really involved with this. And it's strange for me, it's just bizarre, because math comes from intuition, it comes from within. Okay? And it comes from exercises that you have in your daily life. If you think about it, trigonometry came from astronomy, it came from the fact that you looked at the stars and you wanted to explain how they interacted and how they moved. So it shouldn't be that difficult to make kids realize that it's actually fun and interesting. But don't take me wrong, I'm not saying that I made up a new way of educating kids, okay? And I'm actually just trying to depict a scenario that I think most, a lot of people here in the audience who are teachers are familiar with, which is that perfect moment where you motivate a kid to know something more. But the question is still there, how do we motivate these kids? And what I think happened with Gonzalo was that Gonzalo just got lost in the system. Gonzalo was completely off of the system. He was off of the normality. But the system works in the sense that a mean or an average of a kid should follow that pattern 
but he was just off, and no one cared about taking him and just recovering him. To explore a little bit about the system and how the system may be working or not, we have Professor Domingos Fernandes to talk about the educational system in Portugal and why he thinks we should, in a way, reinvent it. Just for you to have a better intuition of what I mean by this, I'm going to talk to you about this example that Ken Robinson talks in his famous talk, uh, TED talk. Um, he talks about this case of a child, a girl, who was in primary school and had a lot of problems with attention. She wouldn't stand still in classes. She would move all the time. So the teachers thought that she had attentional deficit. So her mother took her to the doctor, and the doctor analyzed this kid. Rapidly, the doctor realized that there wasn't a problem with attention with this kid. This kid was just different. So this kid used to say that she felt the drive to move because it was the only way she could think. So she felt this need to move in order to think. Later on, her mother then decided to take her to a dancing school. And later on, she became a famous ballerina. Her name is Gillian Lin. And if you want to know more about her, you just have to Google her. So what I'm trying to say here is that we tend to think that adults, all of us, have different motivations, right? We want different things. We are all different from one, one, one another. I want to do something, you like dancing, I like math, etc. But we don't do this in school. We treat kids usually as all the same, and they should follow all the same pattern and be exactly the same. But this, the reason why we do this is because it's actually a very difficult problem to solve. Should you invest in individuality, so just let them do what they want to do, or should you focus in making them something functional and useful for society? In order to explore this subject a little bit more, we have two members from Scuola de Pont who will talk about this and their own innovative solution to this problem. So, I just want to point out one thing, which is it's extremely difficult to solve the previous question because sometimes our assumptions are completely off and wrong. Okay, so if you take the, the, the field of neuro, neuroscience and psychology and economics, you have this thing called positive reinforcement learning. So in positive reinforcement learning, you can teach an animal, a child, whatever, to do something if you give them a positive feedback. What you expect, so this pigeon, for instance, was trained to do particular behaviors. What you expect from this is that if you give a better reward, then the animal or the subject will perform better a particular task. So this famous economist called Dan Ariely decided to do this, test this idea going to India, to this rural town in India. And he took a group of people and divided them in three groups. One that will get a very low income, very low reward. One that will get a medium amount of reward, and another one that will get a lot of money. So the assumption here, and when we asked you this question, when you submitted to the tickets, who would you expect to perform the worst? You said exactly what you would expect from reinforcement learning. You said that you think that who would perform the worst would be the people who got less money. What they found out, is actually that the people who perform the worst are the ones who got a lot of money. So this makes me think that a lot of the drives that we have are actually nothing to do with reward, or there's some sort of self-generated reward while doing a task. Just as a final thought, the question that we want to solve here in this, in this event is what's the goal of education? And I just want to stress out that I think that there's nothing as noble as being a teacher. Because what a teacher does is taking someone, empowering them to do something significant with their lives. And I think that the three main things that they should do while doing that is give some sense of inspiration, motivation, and, the fact, and some sense of functionality to do something in society. Last thought, I promise. We tend to think that it's us against the universe, us against the world against everyone else. But if you think about it, it's not true. We're part of the universe. We're made of stuff that happens in the universe. We're made of atoms, who made molecules, who make cells, who make us. 
So we're literally paraphrasing Carl Sagan. We're literally made of star stuff, of stuff in the universe. So we're a way for the universe to know itself. And the fact that we can learn about the universe makes it, for me, the most interesting fractal that you can find in the universe. I hope you enjoy this event. <laughs>